From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Dean, Johnny. Mono guarantee. Oh, hiya, Ralph. How are things? Rough. My wife could kill me, Johnny. For the insurance? No, just for kicks, because she's mad, because she wanted a mink coat. In short, she's a woman. I couldn't buy her a mink. I don't make that kind of money. You know how it is in the insurance game. Oh, sure, I know, Ralph. You're down to your last yetch. So what happens yesterday? I lose 80 mink coats, silver blue, worth $100,000. Gone, snatched, disappeared. Warehouse robbery? Check. Bandley Furrier's out in Los Angeles. My wife's about to blow her stack. She says if I can't afford one fur coat for her, then how come I can pay for 80 of them that I haven't even got? How do you reason with a woman, Johnny? I never try. Usually I just send flowers. I've already done that. She ran them through the garbage disposer. So now what do I do? Buy some more flowers. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, 4312 Spring Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Silver Blue matter. <laughs> Item 1, $152.40, telephone and incidentals and transportation to Los Angeles. I called the Mono Guarantee agent out there before I left and got a brief rundown on the case. Among other things, I learned that a man I'd known and worked with before, Detective Lieutenant Raymond Garcia, had been put in charge. And with Garcia on hand, I knew I could count on cooperation by the police. But I still wasn't expecting quite as much as I got. Flight 12 for Las Vegas, Salt Lake, Minneapolis, and Chicago, now loading. At I knocked over the fur joint myself, Flight Johnny. Garcia. The only Sorry, way we get to see you. How have you been? Overworked, oh, underpaid, report. frustrated, disillusioned, unappreciated. In other words, fine. <laughs> Got your luggage yet? Yeah, it's coming right there. Good. We ought to get moving. I've got a squad car outside. What's all the rush? We've got a guy downtown in the hospital I figured you'd want to talk to. Well, he'll wait, won't he? He'd probably like to, if he had any choice. He's dying? Kind of looks that way. He's one of the two night watchmen the gang slugged when they broke into the warehouse. And he's our big one, Johnny. He's all we've got. Has he been able to talk? A couple of sentences during the night. He's got to talk. What do you mean? He's the only one who got a look at them. When he did talk, what did he say? gibberish mostly. He did say one thing, though. They were kids. Just a gang of kids. Oh, that's gonna make it rougher. Yeah, in a lot of ways. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Johnny. Come on, let's go. We took the freeway into town with the accelerator floorboarded and the siren screaming. Racing against time and against dying. Weaving in and out through the four-wheel madness that Los Angeles calls traffic. And then the other side of the coin. The solemn quiet of hospital corridors. The calm voices of the nurses. And the blank hardness of sterile white walls. We sat there beside a bed and waited for a man to talk or to die. But the slow minutes passed and he still did neither. So we waited. Guess that shot the doctor gave him is not going to have any effect. Apparently not. It's a crazy world, Johnny. No, just the people in it. I mean, yesterday, we'd never even heard of this guy. I still don't know his name. And 24 hours later, here we are, a couple of strangers sitting around watching him die. Yeah, it's here on his chart at the head of the bed. Albert Christmas. Strangers. Not even family or friends. He didn't have any family or friends. He lived alone in a furnished room. Worked alone, too, except for one partner. So, a gang of punks jump him and bust his head open. Uh, I'm a bad cop, Johnny. I, I get sentimental about things like this. How'd they work it, Garcia? Uh, it's a warehouse district. The streets are practically deserted at night. A police prowl car checks the street once about every 40 minutes, and they hit at 1.10 a.m., three minutes after the police had passed. Sounds professional. No. Just a smart bunch of kids. The only fur they seemed to know was mink. They passed up a dozen or so chinchillas worth twice as much. How'd they get in? I don't know. Chrisman hasn't been able to tell us. They must have tricked him into opening the door. What about Chrisman's partner? He was making his rounds. They slipped up behind him and slugged him. He didn't see them. He didn't know what hit him. 
And nobody outside in the street saw anything? Saw them leave with the furs or anything? Nope. Or if they did, they're not saying anything. Oh, that's a rough one, Johnny. We haven't got a thing to go on. Except Chrisman here. The shape he's in, that's only a straw. If he recognized any of them, if he lives long enough to identify... Uh, at least the poor devil can groan. I don't know. I think he's closer to being conscious right now than he's been in the last hour. Maybe you're right. Chrisman? Order? He wants a drink. Yeah. Here you go. Uh, that enough? You want some more? Uh, who are you... This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator from Hartford. I'm Lieutenant Garcia, L.A. Police. Warehouse. The kid. It's all right now. You're in the hospital now. It's going to be all right. My head. Do you feel like answering a few questions, Mr. Chrisman? (laughs) It won't take long. Those kids, how did they get in? Telegram. Telegram? They showed me the telegram... Through the window. Yes. When I opened the door, one of them hit me. I... Did you get a look at the boy who showed you the telegram? Yes. Yeah. I, I saw him. Yeah? 18, 19. What did he look like? Five, nine, ten. Dark skin, black hair. Uh-huh. How, how was he dressed? Dark jacket. Hard to think. Any scars? Anything unusual about him? No. <clears throat> My head. Are you sure? Sure. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Any of the others? No. The only one. I... There was a mark on his arm. What kind of a mark? My head. What kind of a mark on his arm? It's too bad. I, I, I... Well, that's that. Yeah, he's passed out again. Well, we got a description. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Right in that area, there are about 50,000 kids who fit it. I talked with Mr. Banley, owner of the furs. Then Garcia and I went down to the warehouse. It stood on the fringe of the river bottom section, fronting the railroad yards and backed up by block after block of weather-beaten slum shacks. We looked through the warehouse, at the racks where the furs had hung, watchman's office where the gang had entered, but knew while we did it that we were only going through the motions. The police technicians had already been over the place inch by inch, and they'd found exactly nothing. Finally, we stepped out the door into the street... A drab gray street, cluttered with things cast off and discarded. Dusty and hollow. There's the story of this whole district down here, Johnny. Right there in that street. Yeah. It's a backwash, a service yard. It's something you need, but don't like to look at, so you shove it out of sight. People you need, but don't want around. It's the same with them. You grew up down here, didn't you, Garcia? Yeah, I grew up down here. That's why they gave me this case. I know this section inside out. And that's why I told you this one was going to be tough. I think I get the general idea. Those kids came from that slum there to the east. One gets you nine on that. The people who live there aren't on our side, Johnny. If they do know anything, they won't talk, is that it? They wouldn't tell a cop the time of day. I don't mean they're criminals. Most of them aren't. It's just that they always put themselves on the other side. What about juvenile gangs? Do they operate around here? There are dozens of them. And there's another thing. A few of these gangs are pretty rough, and people who might talk don't because they're scared to. Oh, it's a great setup, Johnny. A fine place to look for a hundred grand in furs. You know, I've been thinking about the fact that they knew exactly the time to hit. They must have staked out here somewhere. Sure, and probably right in the place you're thinking. Hey, that lunchroom across the street? Oh, they had to be inside, or the prowl car would have seen them. That's the only place open at night. Did you shake it down? Like I told you, Johnny, they won't give us the time of day. Uh-huh. What about me having a go at it? Yeah, maybe they wouldn't smell cop on you quite so strong. The owner's name is Red Wellers. He was on that night. See what you can get out of him if you want. I think I will. By the way, Johnny, 
I know you insurance guys make deals sometimes, no questions asked, just to get the loot back. Sometimes, yeah. Well, before you make any deal on this one, you better remember one thing. Chrisman may die. Say, Mac. Save your money. What do you want? Coffee? Yeah, I guess so. How's business? Buck or two a day. Father in the hole. Want cream? No, I'll drink it black. Want to sink it with it? No, thanks. Are you Red Willis? So that's it. What do you mean? You're in a fur case, ain't you? Maybe. I thought you was the same one, but I couldn't be sure of seeing you across the street. You come up with that cop Garcia a while ago, didn't you? That's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, you come to the wrong address, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. Who was in the lunchroom here just before the robbery? I don't remember. Any young kids here? No. It was all old men with long beards. I see. Ten cents for the coffee. Yeah, they got you real scared, haven't they? Haven't they? I don't know any of these. All right, look. You know Chrisman, the watchman over at the warehouse. He comes in. He didn't know any of these either. What about it? Nothing. Except he's dying. I'm at the Rokin's Hotel if you change your mind. Room 312, Johnny Dollar. Sorry, I don't see no use of me dying too. Follow me, Mac. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, fear stalks the streets, closing the mouths of a sullen and suspicious people, terrifying a lonely girl, and bringing death in a dusty alley. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>